So let's get going. One game. 1826. Okay, we're playing black. Yeah, let's see how... Um, let's actually play a Sicilian. It's been a while. Okay, so <laughs> unfortunately we're facing a C3 Sicilian. And um, I'm going to play uh, an interesting sideline that was introduced to me many years ago by, uh, by, I think my first coach showed me this line. So as you guys know, knight f6 is one main line, d5 is the other main line. And this side line actually starts with d5. But after e takes d5, instead of the conventional queen takes d5, which is obviously, um, which is obviously typical, there is a second move that's not well known. Whoa, knight f3. Well, scratch everything. I I don't think I've ever seen that move before in my life. I mean, I guess his idea is d4. He goes queen a4 check and then picks up the pawn. He's trying to be cute. But obviously he's, <laughs> he's going to lose like five tempi swinging his queen around from place to place. So obviously we should take the pawn. Queen a4 check. He thinks he's cool by doing all of this, but the reality is this is just going to backfire very, very quickly. So how should we respond to this? You know, how should we position our pieces given that he's going to play queen takes c4? There's a, there, there's a mupwa here, most popular wrong answer. I think some of you may be tempted to go bishop to d7, but bishop d7 is awkward. It's passive and it's awkward, and you don't need to prod him to play queen takes c4. He's going to probably do that anyway. Actually, wait a second. Yeah, okay, so I noticed that, yeah, queen takes c4. He had knight e5 in that position, but that wasn't dangerous. We had bishop d7 there. Okay, so now obviously we go knight f6 and attack the queen. And black has pretty much a clear advantage. So this is, we're, we're a brother of the baboon. Yeah, that is that is not the greatest opening. So back to a4, wow. Yeah, this guy. Um, so now, of course, he creates a pin against the knight. And there's no need to let that pin bother us. Let's just go bishop to d7. You know, this this I've talked about this before. This move uh, is passive in certain situations, but in other situations, it's perfectly logical. Um, bishop b5 is quite a short-sighted move. What should we do here? Huh. What should we do now? And this is a very good move to pair with bishop d7. We go a6, we force the bishop to move. If he takes the knight, he loses yet another tempo. He gives up a good bishop. Yeah, I don't really see the rhyme or reason behind any of what he's doing. Uh, bishop c6, bishop c6. And now his light square, I mean, look at these light squares, particularly on this diagonal. We're gonna try to not even let him castle if possible. And when your opponent plays like this, it's important, I think, to recognize that you should already be looking very early on for ambitious moves don't let him complete his development because that's exactly how your advantage is going to fizzle out uh i can sort of sense that he's totally losing track of the game so the sort of conventional approach here would be to go e6 and bishop d6 and complete your development black is better there but then he castles, and it would be a real shame if, if, if he stabilized his position after such terrible opening play. So a couple of moves come to mind in an attempt to punish him. The first one and the move that we're going to play is queen to d3. This is a textbook move. Not only are we preventing him from castling, but we're freezing the, d3, uh, the d2 pawn in place. His only real move is to play queen e2 here. And that leads me to an important point, because a lot of people would look at that position and say, well... The queen trade's clearly got to be bad for black because since um, we have this huge initiative, since we have this huge initiative, we don't want to trade queens. Uh, queen trade is bad for black. It, by definition, it basically lessens the initiative, but it, it doesn't necessarily work that way. Uh, the trade can be good because your minor pieces and your rooks could combine to fulfill the role that the queen was fulfilling, i.e. controlling those light squares and preventing white from developing. And, when your opponent can develop in an end game, that's just as important as him not being able to develop in the middle game, if that makes sense. So we'll have to decide how we play it after queen e2. There's a lot of different moves. The simplest is to play bishop b5 and then bishop takes d3. Uh, and the bishop basically replaces the queen there. But the problem is at the end of that line, he's got a pretty nasty move that somehow 
stays, you know, keeps him in the game, that bishop on d3 is vulnerable to the move knight e5. Now, if he goes knight e5 immediately, look at the king. You'll notice the king is very vulnerable. We'll play queen e4 check. He does play queen e2. So let's consider our other options um, other than bishop e5. What are our other options? Well, I think I see what we should do here. And the correct move, I think, is quite paradoxical because you guys might be thinking of dropping the queen back to d5, but that kind of defeats the purpose. Then we, we allow him to go d4. Um, if we go c4, then after the queen trade, it may seem like his bishop is um, entombed, but it's not. He can go b3, he can fianchetto it to a3. He can sort of work around the edges. Okay, so that doesn't seem to work, but we're assuming here that we can't take his queen. Uh, but we can. I think that the best thing to do here is just to take his queen, force his king out into the center where it's incredibly vulnerable, particularly to checks like bishop b5. Uh, but instead of going bishop b5 check immediately, I think there's no need for that either. We, we want to make the most flexible move. I'm trying to play very flexibly. Let's just castle. Just developing our pieces. And we're keeping all of the advantages of the position. We're keeping his king weak. We're developing our pieces efficiently. I'm sure this is not the best that we could do, but I think it's good enough. And see, he basically blunders a pawn immediately uh, going for knight e5, which looks aggressive, looks like he's attacking a bunch of stuff, but he's, what has he missed? What has he missed? Yeah, bishop takes g2, I mean, rook g1, bishop d5, and... His quote-unquote initiative fizzles out, and he's down a pawn of the terrible position. So this is a satisfactory approach that we took here. Probably not the best, but definitely satisfactory. Now he can play knight takes f7. Bishop takes h1, knight takes, <laughs> knight takes h8. But we're going to trap, trap his knight on h8. We're going to drop the bishop back to d5, cover the escape square on f7, and then we're going to pick up that knight pretty easily on h8. We're going to be a piece up there. It's rook g1, bishop d5, c4. Okay, so we, we don't want to step back to c6 because we lose the f7 pawn. So we do have the very convenient square on e6. That's part of the part of the package here. Part of the package. Okay, knight c3. How should we untangle? It's weird talking about untangling here because we're not even really tangled up. We've got a couple of development schemes that we could adopt here to uh, to get a nice nice development. Now g6, bishop g7, yeah, it's possible. But I'm more annoyed by the knight on e5. I, the knight on e5 is 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 uh, the piece that I want to get rid of, right? That's um that's one of the things you want to get into the habit of doing. Okay, what are my priorities? What what is my top priority in any given position? And oftentimes it's going to be just to eliminate whatever your opponent's strongest piece is, particularly if he only has one good piece because that really uh that really kills whatever chances he may have harbored so knight d7 is simple and strong he's gonna take it we're gonna take with a rook and then you know we're gonna be in phenomenal shape there hopefully this is making sense so far we're playing very simple chess nothing extraordinary not the best but good enough i think well, taking with the bishop is awkward. I'm not sure. Well, I guess what you can take with the bishop and go e6. You know, instead of taking with the rook, it, it's an interesting idea to take with the king. Uh, on, on, I actually really like taking with the king. We, I, that, that's what we're going to do. Can somebody explain to me what the, the purpose may be of taking with the king? Because it seems bad. Like, why would we block the rook? Uh, what's the point here? The, develop the king for the end game. So where are we going to put it? Think about this in terms of target squares. What's the king's target square? Like not e8. We don't want to just the king in the in the end game it, it, it does not have the same role that it does in the middle game. Definitely c6. We walk the king up to c6. It defends c5. Uh, it's out of the way. It's on a light square, so the the dark squared bishop can't bother it, and not, neither can the knight. So it's a ideal square for the king. Then all we're going to have to do. Let's walk the king up to c6, is develop this bishop efficiently. Once we do that, our pieces are developed. We can proceed to the main plan, which is probably going to be attacking this d3 pawn us and, and, and you know, surrounding it and, and winning it eventually. Okay, so how are we going to do that? 
There's a couple of methods of untangling and developing this bishop. Um, the method that I like particularly is to move this bishop out to f5, attack this pawn, and then move the e-pawn out, perhaps to e5, and freeze this pawn even further. Yeah, we can play e6 too. We can play e6 too. But I like the move e5 because it prevents him from freeing himself with the move d4. And I want you guys to notice that, well, I I'm sure some of you are thinking this, aren't you weakening the d5 square? Nah, because we can drop the bishop back to e6 at any moment on demand and we'll be totally fine there. Okay, rook g5 I saw. It's not as, as scary as it looks. If we drop the bishop back, we lose the pawn. But what move is available to us here? Yeah, just g6, defending the bishop. And then we can chase the rook away with h6 or f6, whatever we choose. He's probably going to go knight d5 here would be my guess. With a bunch of pseudo activity. Looks like he's getting active, but we just chase his pieces away easily. And then we start steamrolling him, as you guys will see. I'm anticipating the move knight d5. But this guy is good. He's defended quite well. Uh, he, he has not given us anything easy in the endgame. So I'm pretty happy at that. Yeah, knight d5, h6, get out of there. Bishop b6, get out of there. Right? Knight f6, get out of there. Oh, bishop g7 was better, though. Because now he has knight g4. Ah, but knight g4, we can even just take it. No, now he goes knight e4. Okay. Actually, no, do not go f5. So you see, always be careful. I, I, I double check your moves at all times. One sloppy move like this at this level, like f5, and the effort of the entire game is nullified because it looks natural, but because we played h6, it weakened the g6 pawn. And as you guys can see, he's got rook takes g6 counterattack in the bishop. So you just have to be a little bit more careful than that. And... Having seen that, we can fix the problem first and then go f5. So how can we do that? Well, we don't want to go rook hg8. That's just an inefficient use of our resources. We don't want to consign an entire rook uh, to the sole purpose of defending the pawn. So instead, but I'm not sure why you guys are going h5. And bishop f5 defeats the purpose. We do want to play f5. It's just that we want to defend this pawn first. You push it out to g5, then we play f5. And in addition, this constructs a more robust... Uh, pawn phalanx on the queens on the on the on the king side. So g5 is the best of all of the worlds. It's pretty much crushing here. F5 is coming. C5 is well defended. Look at how nice our king is. It's protecting this pawn, which has turned out to be very important. Now we can already start thinking in the interest of time here of our potential plan once we go f5, and the plan uh, I think stems naturally from uh, a careful you know, assessment of the position. We already know what White's biggest weakness is. Just looking at the position, you should be able to identify visually what White's biggest and most attackable weakness is. And the way to attack it is also incredibly common and you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. D3, the plan is very simple. We're going to stack our rooks on the D file and some sort of tactic or breakthrough is going to announce itself, I think, once we do that. Okay, so B3, he's trying to secure his position in preparation for this, but it's not gonna help. So we can very safely play f5. We don't need to play f4. So f4 would be unnecessary because it would um, it would weaken the e4 square. You know, be very careful about these pawn advances because they might seem very good in the moment, but if they weaken a square permanently, they might not be worth it. And f4 is not going anywhere. You could play it at any moment. Phineas, thank you for the 10. Thank you, Phineas Gage, for the 10 gifted subs. I really appreciate it. Um, Awesome support over the past couple of days. Good to see. Thank you, Phineas. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, knight a4 doesn't do anything. Double. You see how efficiently we're playing? Knight b2. He's trying to defend this pawn. The first thing I notice about this move is that this knight is an undefended piece. Uh, and because it's undefended, I'm already looking for ways that I can exploit that. And I see just the way to exploit it. Um, which is to do what? which is to go bishop f6, x-straying the knight and preparing, of course, the devastating e4, opening up the attack on the knight and the, the attack on the d3 pawn. This is pretty smooth. This is very easy. Like, the, all of these moves are, are incredibly natural if you know what the general plan is. Now, the situation has changed. See, and this is where things get a little bit tricky because 
his knight is no longer able to access the e4 square. Okay, I want everybody to see that. Um, and so what follow-up plan becomes more doable and more, let's say, more appealing now that his knight has no access to e4, not even close? Yeah, so f4 and then bishop f5 building up the attack on the d3 pawn. But before we do that, if we really want to play clinically, if we really want to eliminate all of the counterplay, as some of you guys have noticed, the move b5 is excellent because it stops the knight from coming out to a4 and maybe retooling, rerouting to c3. So we literally squeeze the life out of white here completely. And then when, when we're ready, we're going to play f4, bishop f5, and then maybe e4. It goes f3. Okay, so that doesn't change anything. Let's go f4. Let's safely go f4. Now, this creates two possibilities. Besides bishop f5, we also prepare h5 and g4, adding to the pressure on the king side. So the way to win these positions, as you guys can see, is to build up the pressure on all sides of the board, queen side, center, king side. And at some point, something is going to announce itself, some sort of a tactic, breakthrough, or the breakthrough occurs very naturally. So here, taking on h4 allows to counterplay with rook g6. I don't see the need to allow any of that. Let's just go bishop f5, eyes on the prize. If he takes it, we'll take it. Of course, we could have taken on, on, G, on h4 too, but... Here, this preserves all of the advantages of the position. G4 becomes a serious idea. Now we have the H file in addition. And as Nimzovich said, when uh, one side is so cramped, when the position opens up, that favors the side with more space because you're more easily able to get your pieces from one side of the board to the other. Let's go G4. If he goes Rook H6, we can go Rook D6. Kudos to my opponent. Amazing defense. He's finding like every resource to complicate things, but... I mean, his pieces are so passive. There's just nothing that he can do. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. This game has been a lot of fun to play. I mean, it reminds me of the good old days when I was able to beat people like this. But of course, when you're playing GMs and stuff, like they're, they're not going to succumb uh, that easy. Although not to suggest this guy has succumbed easily. Okay, so what should we do? How do we actually, how do we actually enhance the pressure? We can push to G3, but I would, I would preserve the tension um, and I would make a move here that may seem a little bit weird. I would play rook g8. Just get the rook to the open file because the file opens up and now take with the rook. So I knew that the file was going to open up and I got the rook there first. The rook has done its job on the d file. You don't need two rooks on the d file anymore. One rook is going to suffice, but the king side is open. So now we need to send some of our army to the king side. And, and prepare for the opening of the king side, if that makes sense. There were many ways to win the position. This is just one of them. Uh, and I played a little bit fast here in the interest of time. Now, notice that we're threatening bishop h4 check. That is a classic discovery against the rook. So keeping an eye on the tactics here. A, B is probably going to go here. Yeah, bishop h4 check. And we win the exchange. Finally, we win some material. Now the win is at hand. Takes, takes. He's going to take and go knight c4. Yeah. Um... Let's throw in an intermediate check on h2. Connect the rooks and threaten rook h1 with a skewer. And now the game is actually over. I won't have time, guys, to analyze the game step by step. Um, let's give a check, another check, uh, because I do have to go. But, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'm just playing a little bit faster because, again, there's, yeah, the guy can resign. Takes, takes, takes. King d3. E4. E3. I mean, look at that. <laughs> we can even play F3, but we're going to go E2. Rook H1. Checkmate. 55 moves. Excellent game. And uh, not an easy one. Kudos again to my opponent. That was a very good resistance. So I've written this down tomorrow. Um, we're going to start by, by looking over this game. I'm going to stream... First half of the day tomorrow, um, and uh, it should be should be a fun time. So, all right, guys. Yeah. So, uh, sorry if today was a little bit shorter than usual. Uh, as I said, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, my toughest days. So, I need to preserve a little bit of energy, and I'll see if I can, uh, you know, if my play is a little bit better tomorrow because of you know new inspiration. So, thank you guys. Appreciate the support always. Um, uh, thank you for hanging out and, uh, you know, stay safe, everybody. Have a good rest of your Tuesday.